Hello and welcome to this video, uh, one of a series of videos about the context of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. In today's video, I'm going to focus, as you can tell from the title, on dueling and why that's important. Now, I'm not exclusively of the belief that you should just take a piece of literature, regardless of whether it's poetry, prose, or a play, as being a an historical document, something representative only of the time that it was in. This would make literature a frozen, sort of dead art that was merely an adjunct to history. That's not the case. Uh, literature speaks to us because it deals with universal themes and ideas and characters whose lives we're able to empathize with. It has a universality of it. And it's what it comes to mean for subsequent generations, uh, which is just as important. But you can't ignore the fact that there are, in, particularly in the case of something like Romeo and Juliet and, and Shakespeare in general, that there are some very specific historical contexts that it is interesting and I believe useful to understand uh, for a modern audience. For us, we look at characters like Tybalt, and their behaviour seems extraordinary, out of out of all realms of reasonable behaviour. But once you put this in the context of the time, you actually begin to see that you can look at Tybalt perhaps a little bit differently. Tybalt can be portrayed as a two-dimensional almost pantomime villain style of character. And you do see versions of him like that. And that works perfectly well. But if you think carefully and look carefully at the context in which Shakespeare was writing, the environment that the people of the time were living in and the behaviors and social norms of the time, you can see Tybalt and characters like Mercutio and Romeo himself in a very different light. Dueling is also quite important in Romeo and Juliet because it, it, it occurs at key moments and it's a plot device which drives the plot forward uh, if you're watching this and have studied Romeo and Juliet you will know exactly why uh, when we look at the pivot point in act three scene one which I will cover in this video uh, we can see that the idea of this fight between two people uh, to settle a grudge clearly has huge implications and, and huge ramifications for the plot Anyway, let's get on and have a look at this. The first thing is to do is just establish what is a duel? What makes a duel different from something else? Well, it's ritualized. I mean, that's the first thing uh, to point out, that, that there are rules that surround this and that there's a ritual and a sense in which it is done in a specific way. This is not just a brawl. It's not just a spontaneous street fight that breaks out, although the line between the two could frequently become blurred, that the idea of a duel has rules. And it's a direct descendant, really, uh, of the trial by combat where legal disputes could be settled by seeing who was the best at fighting essentially the idea of might making right and this comes down to the fact that we had a warrior class who were essentially also the ruling class in terms of uh, the medieval knights and medieval uh, nobility and that when two nobles came into dispute for whatever reason, they could then take this recourse to seeing who would be the better fighter. It's hardly a fair means because it does lead to a situation where might means right. But this was the history. This was the background of the situation that surrounded it. And the duel is a descendant of this. And again, they're used for similar reasons to settle manners of honor between people of equal or near enough equal social status. And it was usually only people uh, of higher class who engaged in this, mainly because they were the only ones who were concerned about honor. And frankly, uh, they were the only ones with the time and energy to waste trying to kill each other over matters of what someone had said about someone else uh, if you were of the peasant class you were too busy trying to scrape a living to kind of engage in this sort of thing this is not to say that violence didn't break out amongst all classes but the idea of trying to settle a dispute in some form of ritualized combat was something that really was exclusively a kind of an upper class activity 
So the difference between a duel and an ordinary fight is that there are rules. Rules govern these things. And these rules may have varied from time to time and place to place, but there were some common practices that were pretty much standard no matter where you were, and that these were that this had to be a fight between two equally armed participants or two equally balanced groups of equally armed participants. There are occasions of people who were dueling in multiples, kind of a, a variation of the grand melee that would have been part of a, a medieval tournament. And you can see the direct line. If you think about medieval tournaments with the joust, with the one-on-one -on -one combat on, on foot, and then the grand melee where groups of people from two, two opposing sides or even just a free-for-all battle where but everyone was aware of what the, the outcome would be and people would just go in there and see who would be the, the best fighter. But this was one where there was a strict set of agreed rules. If we think about it, we can even see the same thing in modern combat sports. So boxing, these are two opponents who come from a specific weight class and are boxing at a specifically equal level. You don't get an amateur featherweight fighting a professional heavyweight because that would just be ridiculous. It just wouldn't make any sense. So here they're looking to try and make this as true a test of skill as possible. Again, that's in general terms. It didn't always work out like that. Um, some people would be kind of backed into a corner against someone who was clearly a, a better fighter than them and, and, and characters would you, you know, people would use, and you see characters in, in Shakespeare's plays, using these rules to maneuver somebody who's clearly not going to be capable of winning a duel into a situation where they just literally cannot back down and they're forced to fight and, and are killed by someone who is clearly a, a, a more capable opponent than them. Um, the idea, however, is, is that there has to be an agreement here. And that's really important. And when we look at the play, it's really important to consider this, that there, this is not just a, f a free for all attack, as I said before, where someone just jumps someone at random or assassinates them. That's a very different thing. Uh, this is a declared agreement for two people to fight and they will commence fighting when they both agree that, that is what's going to happen. Now, people could be manipulated into this for all sorts of reasons and in all sorts of ways, but there had to be at least the very form and public observance that these two people had agreed to the fight. And throughout history, there have been attempts to codify um, the rules of what could happen during the duel, um, how to go about doing it, what was and wasn't allowed. Mercutio kind of even makes oblique reference to this at a series of points. He, ta he talks about this um, when he refers to Tybalt as a gentleman of the first and uh, uh, of the first house and of the first and second cause in, in Act 2, Scene 4, where he talks about the idea that, that actually Tybalt is he's been taught fencing and he and he strictly follows the first and second cause you have to have cause to duel he's not someone who's going to willingly get into some kind of spontaneous fight mercutio sees that as as actually a negative uh, as mercutio uh, goes on to elucidate and we'll look a little bit at that uh, in a moment or two so why is the duel important in romeo and juliet well because actually from the very start we see evidence of conflict and conflict between in particular, two households who are both alike in dignity is likely to come down to the idea of conflict being resolved in the form of a duel. And duels do occur. And the idea of dueling structures one of the key plot elements, the death of Mercutio and Tybalt and Romeo's exile. And this all arises out of the idea of a challenge, out of a perceived insult that occurs in Act 1, Scene 5, a challenge that we hear about in Act 2, Scene 4, and the subsequent deaths in Act 3, Scene 1. And so that dueling occurs at key moments. And there's evidence of the dueling in Act 1, Scene 1 as well, where the audience's attention is grabbed as there's a, an on-stage fight, which would have been part of the spectacle of the play as well. So we learn from the start that we've got these two noble houses, that they have an ancient grudge and civil blood. This innocent blood has... Um, been spilled and now formerly civil and peaceful hands are unclean because of this they've got you know th these two houses have got their their hands dirty and that other people have had to also get involved to break out these fights because the thing about <sighs> it's all very well to say we're going to have a duel we're going to fight there's going to be equal fights but unless you really do go to the extent of taking this to uh, a legal duel uh, of which there were 
examples, and there were practices of this where duels could literally take place in the courts of the nobility, in a courtyard under very, very controlled circumstances. If these sorts of things, however, are not going to occur in these specific places, these specific times, if they're going to be in all but name a street brawl, they're not going to be isolated to just the two participants. It's very difficult in a crowded street to duel with a three-foot rapier without somebody um, else getting drawn into this. You're going to knock somebody's stall over. You're going to bang into somebody else. And this is the kind of the context that we encounter when we come to the opening of the play and we come to the idea that the prince has to talk about the three civil brawls that bred by an airy word um, that are broken out in his city and that these things are spilling over under the streets. Uh, conflict was everywhere in Shakespeare's world, from international conflict, which I, talk about, uh, which I do talk about in a different video. And, and again, there's, there's lots of research you can do about the political climate of the times. But on a more personal level, England was a violent place and civilians went armed. If we have a look at this image here, you, you constantly see examples of the nobility walking around with swords. People would have had some form of a weapon on them. The place would have been bristling. There were also demobilized soldiers who, again, would have been armed. Feuding nobles would fight. This was a social norm. The idea that dueling was part of the culture is just a fact of life for people in Elizabethan England. And not just nobles, but the emerging middle classes were engaging in this as well. They're looking at uh, the people in the next level of society above them, and they're aping those behaviours to demonstrate that they too are part of that level of society. Uh, you also have a situation where increasingly, uh, for your word to be seen as good, for your business dealings to be seen as legitimate, your reputation, the perception of you as being honourable, was an absolute necessity. And that frequently meant having to defend that against people who might otherwise impugn your honour. And you needed to be prepared to fight, to defend not just your perceived honour, but that honour is then connected to your financial status and your social rank. If you don't have this, you can't get backers for any of the things you want to engage in. You'll find getting a loan would be far more difficult and people wouldn't maybe trade with you or buy the whatever it is that you were offering or the services that you were offering. And therefore, to, a certain, to people of a certain level, it, it was an absolute necessity to defend this. And this frequently led to these honor duels. The right to trial by combat, incidentally, was still in English law until 1819. This was the sort of thing I, people didn't. People obviously, this was getting less and less frequent and it was frowned upon and you know, the, the various monarchs and rulers just simply said, no, we're not doing that. This is the trial that we're going to have. But the, the right was still embedded in law and it wasn't removed until 1819. And indeed, you see examples of this, not just in England, but throughout the continent. And this gives rise to this thing, the idea of the culture of the bravo, not just bravo as in congratulations, but the bravo, the young testosterone driven masculine male who uh, is violent as just part of a social norm, you know, is uh, who who pushes his will onto others through physical dominance. It would be nice to think that that was a, a cultural feature exclusively as, of Elizabethan England. But if you look at various sort of bits of society, you can still see this in, um, in, in place that this idea of being the biggest, roughest, toughest character has been something that has been aspired to by young men throughout history. Uh, you see it in the idea of the American gunslinger. You see it in the um, the football hooligans of kind of the Europe of the uh, of the nineteen eighties and nineteen nineties. You see this occurring in sort of the the combat sports cultures that have emerged of late uh, across the globe. So this was just seen as a way that a young man could prove themselves. They could, they would hold up their name and their family name by all costs, but they would then kind of go looking for this violence. This would be because you've got this kind of toxic mix of testosterone, a culture which is actually quite dangerous and violent anyway, so you need to be prepared to defend yourself. And then you have the pressure to act a certain way. 
it gives rise to this group within society who, surprise, surprise, step up to these social expectations and these societal pressures. It's reflected in Romeo and Juliet. You actually hear this. Uh, Tybalt's reaction to uh, Romeo, the Montague, in his house. You know, his instant reaction is to violence. Like, are you disrespecting me by being here? Right, let's fight. This is something that, as a teacher, certainly you, you do hear amongst teenage, and I'm sorry, most frequently boys, not exclusively, but most frequently. But this idea that, um, Oh, he said something about me. I've got, I'm not letting him get away with that. And, and this whole kind of fronting up business that you get. And this wasn't just, as I say, an exclusively upper class thing. You see at the start of the play, the young servants aping their masters and looking for a quarrel. They say the quarrel is, among, uh, is between our masters. I and us are their men as well. So let's have a look at how they went about doing this. What did they use? Well, then we see... During Shakespeare's time, we see the emergence of a particular, a particular kind of dueling. Fighting prior to this point had happened with a variety of weapons uh, that looked a little different. Um, battlefield weaponry was heavy; it was designed to smash through armor. But we're not talking about a battlefield here. We're talking about uh, something else. Now, these are not the thin, flexible sports blades that you see in um, modern sports fencing. They are still an evolution of a battlefield sword, but they're different. Uh, they are longer and thinner. They are capable of cutting, but it's mainly the point that's doing the work. And these are really des designed for civilian defense against unarmored targets. So a, a rapier isn't much use against a heavily armored knight. You have to get a fairly lucky strike. You might be very, if you're very, very good, you can probably find a gap in the armor and drive the point through it. But at the same time, you have a massive, heavily armoured, very fit, very capable human being with a presumably a shield and a broadsword, which is very heavy and very um, smashy and cutty, trying to slam this thing down on you. And, you know, you've got to have a massive amount of skill to be able to get around those things. So this is not a battlefield weapon. And the battlefield is changing anyway, because actually you've got the introduction of gunpowder, which makes big, heavily armoured knights essentially just very easy, very shiny targets for uh, high power projectiles. So we begin to see these kinds of blades, which are far more used against an unarmored target, proliferate. And of course, they're perfect for the civilian context. They're, they're relatively light by comparison. They're still quite heavy things if you ever get hold of a, a, a proper uh, a rapier. And if you've ever do something like a, a theater workshop and they've got the stage swords, they're surprisingly heavy, surprisingly weighty things. But these are all over the place, but they're not uh, used in exclusion. They're, they're often used paired with another weapon, something defensive as well, because we're not wearing armor. You, need, you really are looking to have something else in your other hand. And it's, it was usually a dagger, a dagger that could be used for parrying, catching and breaking an opponent's blade. And of course, if the opportunity presented itself, it could provide a weapon in and of itself. But we also see, as we saw in the previous slide, the use of buckler shields, small shields that could be used in a defensive mode, and even things like cloaks were used. And these techniques were often taught in the fencing salons that were around at the time. Sword is also a status symbol, always has been. So again, you can see that you've got this, this whole range of pressures to bear arms and to be prepared to use arms. So a sword is a status symbol. So if you're a noble, if you want to be seen as someone who's up and coming, a gentleman, you carry a sword. So think about the, the samurai and the feudal knights. What marks them out? It is their sword. It is that thing that is famous. How did we discover the one true king of England? The sword in the stone in Arthur's time. These are woven into legend. So it's always been a, a status symbol. And because it's a more expensive weapon than most of the battlefield things, if you think about a spear, a spear is just a stick with something sharp and pointy on the end of it. And that doesn't take very much to do. And it's also relatively easy to train to use. You don't have to have a lot of money to learn how to poke someone with a stick. Uh, you don't have to have a lot of money to get a stick with which to poke someone. Uh, however, to get a sword, that's expensive. They take weeks, months even to forge and finish. 
and they use a lot of metal. Metal is difficult to get hold of. Metal is expensive. And a forger, the, someone, you know, a blacksmith, a swordsmith specifically, because you want someone who has that specific skill set, is expensive to employ. And these things are status symbols in as much as a car is today. So the more elaborate and the more obviously expensive it is, the more wealthy and powerful you are. And it's also the idea is that you're carrying something that is difficult to use in relative terms. And you are making a statement here. You are saying, I've got this, know how to use it. Because frankly, if you don't know how to use it, you are a fool to carry one because a weapon in the hands of someone who doesn't know how to use it is just as dangerous to the person who's got it as it is to anyone who's on the other end of it. Uh, and most young men of the time of a particular level of social status would have taken training and they would have learned how to use these from a fairly young age. So let's now have a look at how this is represented in the actual play itself. So have a look at Act 1, Scene 1. Have a go and have a look at some ver some versions of it. Obviously, you've got the, the gun play that you see in uh, the uh, DiCaprio version. When you see the Baz, the Baz Luhrmann directed version with Leonardo DiCaprio as Romeo, you have a gun play sequence there. But look at the versions that actually set this as, as a sword fight, and you'll see how this comes about. And it starts with it starts with the Capulet servants, who I do think do really are portrayed. The Capulets really are portrayed as kind of being the antagonists in this entire affair. But it starts with the Capulet servants attempting to provoke a fight. They're trying to insult without directly insulting, so that someone will ask them for a deal. So they've got an excuse to fight here. And here you even see a, the, them saying, "Is the law of on our on our side?" So they're still trying to make sure that they stay. As close well, as, as as within the rules as possible, and the the capulets eventually actually end up doing that thing of, do you want to fight this ridiculous kind of male masculine challenging? Oh look, there's someone from the other side. They're wearing a different shirt to me. I'd best ask them if they wish for some form of physical conflict. And here you have oh, we've got two people on rival sides. Do you want to fight? Are you looking for a fight? Do you quarrel, sir? Of course, the other one goes quarrel, sir. No, sir, I can't do that. But eventually, of course, it descends into a brawl. And then we see Tybalt and Benvolio enter. We see the 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 other characters of higher status come in. And this is an interesting thing because here we see Tybalt's attitudes on the page and on the stage. Tybalt's First line, what art thou drawn amongst these heartless hinds? And again, you can even hear the the alliteration, which gives that kind of like hissing contempt that you hear in, in, in the character's voice, how he feels about these servants. They're hinds, they're prey animals, essentially. These are female deer, the kind of things that an upper class person would would hunt. And he's surprised to see Benvolio with his, his sword there. Turn the it's really interesting. If he if he really wanted to just kill Benvolio, he had a perfect opportunity when Benvolio's back was turned to stab him. It's a lot easier to stab someone in the back, particularly if they're armed with a sword. They don't see it coming, they can't stop it. But that's not what Tybalt is looking to do here. Firstly, that would be dishonorable. So he would suffer that loss of face and that loss of honor. But secondly, it's about proving that he can beat Benvolio. And he's absolutely convinced of this. He says, turn the Benvolio and look upon their death. He doesn't even think that there's any chance that this, this could go any other way. Um, Benvolio, of course, is saying, whoa, whoa, I'm not looking for a fight here. And if we go back to the rules, the duel has to be agreed by both parts. But Tybalt here pushes these laws about as far as he possibly can. He says, what? Drawn and talk of peace. It's too late. You already have your sword out. Benvolio has drawn his sword to separate the fighting servants. It's a good plan because trying to separate people who've got swords with your bare hands is never going to end well. So he uses his sword to beat their blades down. He even says, I do, but keep the peace. Put up thy sword or manage it to part these men with me. Use your sword to, to get these guys apart. This is not how ben, uh, how Tybalt wants this to play out. He sees Benvolio's drawn sword as almost a direct challenge or an acceptance of Tybalt's own challenge. So they fight, as it says there in the sage direction. 
have a quick look then at Act 1, Scene 5, because here again we see Tybalt's propensity to leap to violence as a defence. Now, when we look back at this scene, Act 1, Scene 1, here Tybalt seems unreasonable. But if we look here, he says, as I hate hell or Montagues and thee. And if we go back to this idea of the ancient grudge between them, Tybalt's been brought up with the idea that these guys are the enemy. And he's also brought up with the idea that he has to defend his honour and that they have to struggle for their position in society. So therefore, rivals are fair game. Rivals are the people that you need to fight, to put yourself, you know, to keep yourself in your position. You have to put others below you. So when we think about that, actually Tybalt's reactions are a kind of a social conditioning to the context that he finds himself in. So here we see him when he hears a Montague, this by, his, this by his voice should be a Montague, doesn't know who, he just knows that it's a Montague, recognises the accent. Fetch me my rapier. So the first thing he wants to do is jump to violence, and the rapier there, the, the status symbol, the blade. And Shakespeare's very clear to have that in there. There's no kind of rhythmic reason, there's no other reason he, he he couldn't have named another weapon sword would have been perfectly fine but he's identifying that it's a rapier because he's contextualizing this in the current kind of the contemporary situation where rapiers are now the the, the choice of weapon for uh, nobles who spend their time dueling this is a direct reference to the, to the thing that's happening at the time shakespeare is writing and there's a reference to honor now by the stock and honor of my can he, he's come here and he's come to this party and he's disrespecting us and it's honor that's driving this again to strike him dead this is interesting though because to strike him dead i hold it not a sin you can play this in a number of ways really does he really mean he wants to kill him is this just hyperbole on tybalt's part or is this tybalt as a character who is perhaps just using all of these social trappings as an outlet for his own you know, sociopathic behaviours. Again, different directors have played this in different ways across the time. But what is interesting is here is that in a duel, it wasn't always necessary to kill your opponent. You could fight to first blood. It wasn't always easy not to kill someone. It's not an easy. Th it's it's a very difficult thing to be so precise that all you do is hurt someone with three feet of steel which someone else also has, you know, you, you aren't going to be able to be as precise as, oh, I'm just going to nick his shoulder and then that'll end the fight. You know, there's a, a reasonable chance that whatever damage you do will be relatively fatal, particularly given the fact that we're talking about this, the, the 16th and 17th century here where medicine not really particularly advanced. And it is interesting here that there's a recognition, though, I hold it not a sin, that there is something sinful about killing, but Tybalt sees this as, this just this doesn't count, because he's insulted our honour, therefore our societal expectations, it's fine, we can do this. It's not a sin, because I can bypass the moral constraints that normally hold me back from killing people because he's insulted my honour. Let's have a quick look then at Act 2, Scene 4, where Tybalt is identified specifically as a duelist. So we see Benvolio say, hath sent a letter to his father's house. This is going through the ritualized protocol of establishing the context for an actual duel. This is becoming not quite legal, but at very least formal. A challenge. Uh, Mercutio is interesting. He seems almost excited by this and this probably wouldn't have been too much of a surprise i mean we you know the idea of oh this is going to be some sudden violence this is going to be great you know this is unfortunately kind of young men's behavior <sighs> throughout history and volio it's an interesting to see his reaction romeo will answer it there is there is no thought in either mercutio or romeo uh, or, or benvolio's mind that romeo will back down from this because of that social pressure, that idea that it has to be answered with a public defense of honor. And then here we hear Mercutio go off on one uh, again. Uh, the, he, he has done this a couple of times and he has some very strong opinions uh, about 
uh, about Tybalt. And we'll talk about Prince of Cats at a, at a different point. Courageous Captain of Compliments. I mean, we hear that again, you've got that, that use of the alliteration and that could you know be in place of other less pleasant words he might he might use about Tybalt um and this uh, and we hear however a few other comments and a, a recognition of Tybalt's status um we've got these references here the very butcher of a silk button is this a reference to Tybalt's skill? Well, yes, he is capable of cutting a button off his shirt. But however, Mercutio doesn't necessarily see this as a good thing. This kind of highly ritualized, highly practiced skill, which lacks any spontaneity or true kind of grit behind it, is this learned sort of fashionable style of doing things. Oh, he can slice the button off a shirt, but can he really fight? Uh, Tybalt, uh, Mercutio seems to be suggesting. He's a duelist. He's not a fighter. He's a duelist. He doesn't know what a real fight is. A gentleman of the very first house and of the first and second cause. He sticks closely to the dueling form, uh, to their rules and to the, to, to the reasons behind having a duel. He won't just fight. And again, Mercutio seems to, seems to see this as a negative. He seems to see this as being something that it's an unnecessary, an importation. Um... This is something that isn't something that Mercutio likes about Tybalt. Uh, not that there's very much that we find Mercutio does like about Tybalt. Uh, it does lead you to think, is there perhaps some history between them? Uh, but we can see here Shakespeare is doing something very specific. He talks about the immortal Passado, the Punto Reverso. Now, these are actual specific fencing terms for thrusts that were taught in Italian fencing schools of the time. And there was, uh, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of evidence that Shakespeare and his players would have been, would have attended these fencing schools themselves to learn stage fencing. And Shakespeare is making a deliberate reference that people would have picked up on. And again, there was a kind of a conflict in English society that saw these imported fighting stars and these imported blades, these rapiers from the continent as being something new and fangled. This is uh, what we see Mercutio doing. He expresses this kind of distaste and disdain for these new, fangled, fashionable imports that had nothing to do with the way people had behaved prior to this. Uh, he even talks about the, this stands so much in the new form. They kind of sit on knees on the old bench, so they're all about the new and the old. It's just, oh, they can't sit easily with with, with what it is to be truly, you know, an in, you know, in this instance, it's an Italian noble, but it's really talking about English perceptions of these imported Italian fighting styles. Of course, the whole play is set in Italy, but really what Shakespeare is doing is he's talking about the situation as we find it in England at the time the play was written. So again, that, that use of the word fashion mongers is really interesting. This idea that this is just fashionable. Fencing is fashionable. Dueling is fashionable. But then we have to move on, of course, if we're going to talk about dueling, to Act 3, Scene 1. This, of course, is the pivotal scene where it kind of all goes wrong. I mean, it's all gone wrong from the very start. We know that because we're told. So this is fate. They can't get away from it. But here is the, the plot device that drives that key pivotal moment. Uh, they're out now uh, in these hot days in the mad blood stirring. Um, as, as Benvolio remarks earlier on in this scene, and Tybalt arrives looking for Romeo, and Mercutio is desperately trying to provoke him in some way. But Tybalt, of course, true to character, doesn't bite, says, fine, we can have a word and a blow, a fight, some form of violence, if you give me a reason. Tybalt isn't going to just rise to this, he's going to wait until there's an obvious reason which warrants his fighting. Of course, this is again, Mercutio is looking at this thinking, well, if you have to stick to these rules, could you not take some occasion without giving? And then we get the arrival of Romeo. 
And again, you see Tybalt sticking to these rules. And this is important because I do think this is a really interesting point. And directors can play this in multiple ways. If you look at the Baz Luhrmann version, there's a very interesting reaction from Tybalt. But if you look at the way other directors have played this scene, you see a very different complexion. You see perhaps a more sympathetic Tybalt and perhaps a less sympathetic Mercutio, despite the pathos of his inevitable end, we see something different because here we see Tybalt saying something, turn and draw. He's, he's not going to attack him. He's not just going to stab him there and then. He has to wait until Romeo is going to fight. Now with Benvolio, the blade was already drawn and Benvolio was facing him. And there was already violence in the offing. Here, Romeo is offering no, no sense in which he's responding. In fact, he does something quite interesting. He uses the term of satisfaction. He says, protest and never injured thee, and therefore be satisfied. So the idea that honor is satisfied, he almost offers an apology. Romeo is suggesting that he never did anything to insult him. In fact, actually, he respects him. He says, I can, but I love thee better than thou canst devise. Of course, by this stage, Romeo and Juliet are married, although no one else in this particular scene is aware of this. And Mercutio's response becomes quite important here. Did Mercutio have to step in? Is he standing up for the honor of his friend who won't stand up for his own honor? Is he using this as an excuse to fight someone he doesn't like? I mean, I, th I personally feel that if you look at the venom with which Mercutio has referred to Tybalt prior to this point, he's simply using this as an opportunity to fight Tybalt because he doesn't like Tybalt very much. Uh, we even get this interesting reference here, the uh, Stoccata, the dueling field. Alice Stoccata carries it away. You know, the, 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 the dishonorable, vile submission, the, 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 the dueling field has taken away your honor because you're refusing to step on it. There's different ways you can interpret this line, but whatever it is, we can see that Mercutio is going to step in and find out, oh, I'll defend your honor if you're not going to. Again, Tybalt, of course, his, his response here is interesting. Tybalt, you rat catcher, you've got this in public insult. Tybalt's response though, what what what's thou have with me? Because he doesn't want to challenge Mercutio. This is not what he's about. He doesn't see Mercutio as someone who's insulted his honor. There's also probably the fact that Mercutio is related directly to the prince. So Tybalt might be more sensible than to to call out one of the prince's allies. However, when directly challenged, I am for you. The moment he's directly challenged, I'm gonna Kill you. Will you take your sword out, or I'm going to strike you around the ears with mine? Okay, well, I'm not going to, I can't back down now. Here, says Tybalt, I am for you. And here they go. And of course, you get, even at the even at the last, even just before this fight breaks out, and of course, the inevitable consequence being Mercutio is, is killed, and then subsequently Tybalt is killed. We hear, see, uh, see here Mercutio still ridiculing this Italian fencing style. Again, another Italian term being said, ooh, come sir, you're Passado. Uh, Mercutio still underestimates to an extent Tybalt. But here, the, it's, it's really important to understand here that actually dueling is an important context and the culture of dueling and this world of violence in which Shakespeare lives is really important. So in conclusion, the duel was commonplace. This was a thing that happened. It's different from the world that we live in, where honor duels just hopefully shouldn't happen. Uh, I don't doubt that people try to settle matters of reputation through violence, unfortunately, but dueling in the, 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 the way that we understand it was commonplace in Shakespeare's time in a way it isn't now. And that, you know, we've had these imported styles of fencing and sword play that were seen as fashionable and people often did look down on although they were widely taken up by a whole range of people including shakespeare's own players all of whom would have been very competent swordsmen and that as a young man one of the things you would have done you would have been expected to step up and defend your honor and there were countless examples of this occurring toxic mix gives rise to a context which gives us some understanding of what are otherwise seemingly incredibly arbitrary actions 
almost designed specifically to drive the plot forward. Yes, yes, they are. But they are understandable through the lens of the social context and the history of the time. So hopefully this has provided some extra food for thought. If you want to do any further reading, here are a range of sources that I used putting this video together. Um, and again, I think they're well worth dipping into. This is just one of a number of contextual factors to think about. But I do think that if you think carefully, you can really see a different complexion to key elements of the play coming out through this. Hopefully this video was useful to you. Please feel free to subscribe, have a look at the other videos that are on um, this channel and have a look at some of the other bits and pieces I'm putting out there about the context of Romeo and Juliet and about the individual scenes themselves. Okay, thank you very much and goodbye.